here. Hello and welcome to Dancer's Support Mission by Sabine Chalon for Shine Your Light. This is a new episode of Dancer to Dancer, Words of Wisdom. I created this platform to meet the person behind the dancer and share with you all not only the highlights of someone's career, but also the challenges behind the scenes. Truly, my wish is to bring healing in the dance world, dancing to heal, healing to dance, one artist at a time and one personal story at a time. I do believe that storytelling gives us an opportunity to learn from another person's experience and it can shape, strengthen or challenge our opinions and values. Hopefully this will allow you to embark or reflect on your own personal healing journey inspired by others' experiences. And of course, if you find those interviews valuable and interesting, please share them with your friends and don't forget to send me some feedback. So today I'm absolutely delighted to welcome Aaron Watkin. Aaron, thank you so much for taking the time to be with me. I know you're a super busy man. I mean, you know, you're, you have a lot um, uh, in your arms right now and, and more to come. So thank you so much for taking that time to be with me today. Yeah, no problem. My pleasure. <clears throat> so Aaron, we met um, a long time ago. It's hard to say, right? We were talking about that <laughs> before the interview. That <laughs> Many moons ago. <laughs> we can count that in decades now. Uh, we met in Amsterdam. Uh, you've had a very long journey after that. You know, it's it's interesting to see how Amsterdam has been such a platform for so many dancers to evolve in so many directions. It's really beautiful. Yes, it is. It is. So um, let's start like usual, you know, with all my guests. What I want to know is how you started, why you started dancing, and when you decided that this would be a profession, because there's a big turning point usually, you know, for people to decide that. Uh, I think mine is, um, you know, I didn't, I got involved sort of because my sister was involved. No one really in my family has any affinity with dance. Um, my sister was taking some tap dancing and I joined in because I liked the sounds of tap. I really enjoyed that. And then my teacher locally had said, you should take some ballet to help your improve your upper body. And my sister saw an audition for the National Ballet School and was going and I just kind of tagged along. <clears throat> I had no training. They kind of stretched me and I remember them looking at my feet and saying, oh, and I didn't even know what that meant. So I just kind of tagged along. I was from, I'm from a small town in on Vancouver Island, Canada, British Columbia. And it's five hours on the plane to the National Ballet School in Toronto. So I went, set off at 12 years old, uh, for a summer school and then was taken on and very not very interested or on board for the first two years because of being very homesick and then something just clicked and I started to understand and really appreciate it um, we also had flamenco and which was kind of similar to tap which I loved so that was my outlet ballet always stressed me um, <laughs> yeah I mean formal classical ballet but things then moving on in my career more contemporary works I really enjoyed and I learned how to enjoy the classical things more too so yeah I just kind of got on board that way and then I had the, an incredible opportunity to create with William Forsyth the ballet called The Second Detail in the National Ballet of Canada and our relationship started there um, I Wait, 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 you were in the school then? I was in the company. It was my first year or my second year in the National Ballet of Canada. So I graduated from the school. I was taken as an apprentice and then into the company for a year and a half. And right, uh, I think it was 1991, a choreographer named William Forsyth came to create for us. At that time, I mean, Reed Anderson was a director, obviously he knew Bill and he was quite well known, but we didn't really know him. And I was out to lunch, you know, I didn't know who he was, but I just thought he was amazing. It was so fun and he engaged with us and really has that talent to make you feel special. And um, I ended up through some casting changes, getting put into the first cast and he created a beautiful role for me. And uh, yeah, it was a wonderful experience in the beginning of a long, very, um, very close relationship professionally with him. I then went on to London 
to the English National Ballet. That was my first company in Europe. And then to the Dutch National, where we met, of course, and that was seven years um, there. And then finally on to Frankfurt Ballet, because Forsyth had been asking me if, during over different periods to go. And I really wanted to stay in a classical company longer. But then I decided at 27 to, to go to Frankfurt and was with him for a few years. And then kind of I went to Nacho in Madrid. And then I just didn't feel that I, I guess I never really felt that dance was my my real calling. I always loved the other side, the rehearsal side. We um, talked about that. I remember very yeah. well. And I think I knew at a young age that I wanted to do more ballet mastering. Um, and Forsyth offered me the opportunity to set some of his productions. And then I got an amazing, like just traveling the world between guest teaching companies and setting his works. Um, wonderful experience. And then after setting one of his pieces in Dresden, they I was contacted by their general director, the intendant, saying that um, they're looking for a director and they would be very interested. I think Forsyth put my name in the hat there, which I'm very grateful for. And then that's how that started. And funnily enough, taking on the role of a director, I had been thinking about it for a long time. And then I was sort of at a point where it's never going to happen because someone's not just going to knock at my door. I was in Madrid, sort of freelancing. And, and I felt a little, I was feeling a bit discouraged because I was just in the circuit of guest teaching and feeling like I wanted more. And then this beautiful opportunity came and I also realized how much I love the administrative side of the job. So planning, you know, and making things work with schedules and programming and also collaborating with the broader range. So not just artists, but all the administrative aspects, which I found really inspiring and interesting to learn. It's a big part of your job. So that's good. Because yeah. I think a lot of people struggle with that. I mean, no. I mean, I think, you know, in, in honesty, the idea of being an artistic director in the traditional sense is really, uh, for me, mind blowing because it's a person that would have to have so many skill sets and so much knowledge and mostly, you know, quite frequently. Very little training for it. <laughs> it's the only, I was going to say, it's the only official sort of director position that you wouldn't need official training for or apparently but obviously we do and things are changing now I learned everything on the job which is one way but of course if I had been prepared had taken some business management courses some arts management also psychology which is probably 60 percent of the job um, I think I would have been much more prepared coming into it and I think I'm a very different person now than I was 17 years ago when I started in Dresden. A lot with the experience, I have a lot more, um, a lot less naive and um, maybe also not so worried about trying to please everyone and do the right thing for everyone, really following my beliefs and being a bit more comfortable with myself. In your 50s, I think you start to be a bit more comfortable with who you are. Well, you're you know? supposed to be, yeah. But you're supposed to be. I don't know. It doesn't mean that I always know what I want, but I think at this point in my life, I do know what I don't want anymore, and that, that I'm not interested to put my energy into certain things that I might have given more to younger. Um, but yeah. Well, so and it takes. I mean, you have to be solid, you know, and stable to do this job because you have to resist all the winds and the currents and the you know and the storms. Um, I mean, I from having seen it from close, I know it's probably the hardest job to do, you know, and very, uh, un in a way, ungrateful. I mean, with Ballet yeah. Master job, because I've done that, <laughs> I know that it is really, really hard because you you need to give so much and you need to hold so much. And then in return, very often, it's a lot of complaints. <laughs> yeah, or you're like the unsung soldiers, I always say, you're behind the scenes, you're not featured, but you're really holding the whole company together. And that's, that's the thing is most what I find, you know, what is the most sort of um, intricate type of work that you do and sort of 
uh, profound work that you need to understand is human psychology. It's social skills. It's how to relate to people because you're relating to people constantly and then you have to make the final decisions a lot. And no matter what your decision is going to be, you're going to be disappointing certain people. So I, I always try to just really think through and even more now in my life and with ENB and the, the team I have, I'm much, I'm, I've always been collaborative, but I think now I'm even more so, so that I'm not just getting information, deciding in one second and making a decision whether, where, where I might have done that in the past. I would take my time, I would discuss it, I would see different people's opinions so that I'm really making these decisions confident that I've thought through them and then I can stand behind them even if they are disappointing mm -hmm. some people but that that's I mean that's one of my you know um I don't know passion I would say it's like yeah. you know, thinking that we've all been dancers and we've all had our careers and everything and some people like you take direction of I mean this is a very important position because you have in charge a lot of dancers you know who um who are very um, into their own tunnel, you know, because that's yeah. that's the way it is when you're a dancer. And I've been like that too. And, you know, you don't necessarily see the whole picture. Right. But what I find really still very missing, and you, you've just touched on that, which I think is really important, interesting and important, is that if you don't do any work on yourself, right, you obviously are going to project on other people. And when you are in a position of power, then it becomes very destructive for everybody involved, including you, I meaning, you know, because in the end, you work against yourself. And my wish for ballet, and you know, it's, I think it's a big wish, <laughs> but it's for, yeah, the people who come into this position to be able to do this work on themselves in a safe place, you know, so that so that they can feel safe in the studio because it's also very confronting to be a ballet master in front of those 30 people who are ready to eat your life, you know, if if you do the Absolutely. wrong thing. Absolutely. So, I, I completely agree. I so, think so, you know, one aspect, Sabine, now more than ever, if I look at the climate in the world, the temperature, what the norms were, the sensitivities, let's say, of the times when I started in 2006 and what they are now, what they've become now. I mean, especially in North America, but Europe is slowly getting on board with this, too, is that it you can't operate how we used to. The, the idea of just sort of someone dictating, you do this because of this, you right. know, close your mouth, it doesn't work and it shouldn't work. And we need to reevaluate, but that is also challenging because now everything is a conversation practically. So you, it, it takes a lot more time. You really have to invest and you have to give the time. You have to give the dancers a voice. You have to give your teachers a voice. You have to give the the whole establishment some way to contribute otherwise people I, I always say it will implode and they slowly start to implode under the old system and and for me that's hallelujah but uh, you know I, I, but i know it's it's really hard to know how to tackle this because in the end it all comes down to your own personal work if everybody does it then we'll be able to cooperate better right it's like it's I mean, I think it should be part of the, the curriculum. That's what I'm trying to, you know. Um, no, I agree it should be. But the point is that we're dealing with human beings and everyone is such a different organism. Some but that's the whole are, point. It's like yeah. that, that's learning who you are and how you function so that you can operate at your best without infringing on others because that's what freedom is, isn't it? <laughs> But but then you get these the psychology of different people and what they've been through. So even if they understand that, there's certain people that can do that in a direct, clear way, and other people that have so many issues. One point I wanted to just um, say to you is that moving forward into ENB, we have a new structure. So I'm the artistic director. I mean, we have that traditional executive director and we have a COO, chief operating officer. So wait, because you haven't said that you, you're actually going to go from 17 years in dress oh, yeah. 
And you've so, been appointed. I'm sure most people know it, but just for anybody who's not aware of that, you've you're gonna be you you tell me. <laughs> yeah, so I as of next season, I officially will be the new artistic director of the English National Ballet in London. After 17 years of Dresden, I'll be leaving the Semper Opera Ballet. And I'm extremely excited to at this new chapter in my life, both personally and professionally. I feel like I've given as much as I can to the Semper Opera and really tried to bring it up to a place in the world where it's sitting on an international platform as a recognized dance company. I think I'm leaving it in a good place for someone to continue. And I really, it's funny, 30 years ago, I was a dancer in ENB and now I'm coming back as a director. So there is some connection with the company and with London and with people. And it feels in a strange way, like coming home. I have not been in an English speaking country since I left Canada. I mean, since I left ENB, basically. Yeah. So it's also communication wise to be able to really speak in my native language and explain myself and be much more um, involved in, in all the aspects of directing is really, really exciting. But my point was in Dresden, there's a general director, a music director, ballet director, um, and the general director is also the opera director. So it's a tiered system and very much with one person at the top. In London, the structures change so that I'm leading with two other people equally. So I know lots of companies have an executive director. I don't know in the dance companies if the chief operating officer to do with the finances is also on that level, but we are running it as a threesome, which is just great because I can focus really on the artistic side and they focus on their expertise. And together, I feel like we can be much more effective. And one more pillar that we're adding is a person who is called like performance development um, coach, and he's full time. Um, and he is just an independent person. He effectively does report in the roster to myself and the executive director, but he is not reporting to me with details. The dancers and the staff can go to him anytime. And he manages a lot of, um, he has a degree in psychology and conflict management. So he's really experienced. And he was also a professional dancer. Oh, great. It's a, it's a great mix. And we've just introduced it and it's working so well also to do with like anxiety, with performance anxiety, with just managing their expectations, but also giving them tools to improve the situations for themselves. And then what happens instead of everything coming to me right at the beginning, there's other ways they can, you know, help themselves. And then if they do still need to see me, of course, I'm there. It's not like I'm out of the equation, but I would say that this person's doing so much valuable work. And I think these four pillars are a secret to moving forward with the dance company in the future, because the one person just... I think it's yeah. just doesn't work. Well, I mean, I did, that that leads me to a question I wanted to ask you. You know, because uh, I mean, you know, as dancers, we we used to talk a lot, and you know, we had all you know ideas and judgment and whatever, because that's what we do. And do you think? Did you did you repeat some mistakes that you know you were you were seeing in other directors because you've seen quite a few directors right so or did you manage to do it the way you want it i mean obviously okay. this is a long um... i mean i would answer that in a different way more that you know it's kind of trial if you're not educated and you're you've been a dancer and you don't have any formal extra education you're just kind of jumping in and you're hoping that that person has those intuitive skill sets already in place i mean i always i never felt like i was the king the all knowing you listen to what i'm saying i've never done that i've always felt the power that the director is only as strong as his team and really collaborating with my team to 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 make sure we make the best decisions. But of course, I would say when you're naive coming in and you don't really know, you think you know, but you don't know, yeah. you end up making, what do you call it, mistakes? I mean, you you 
you you learn you start to evolve i would not do things the same way i did them before there's many things also to do with my management of when i'm feeling overwhelmed and frustrated how that would have come out before and how that comes out now um never writing an email when you receive something that you're upset about waiting like just simple things and i think um yeah it just learning being open being open and being very hungry to actually learn not thinking you know everything mm -hmm. i think that's quite important because this is just too big to know everything <laughs> and it's a, it's a shift in paradigm right because this is the paradigm we were in and yes. It was actually really frustrating for a lot of dancers, but I think it was also frustrating for directors because it's, it goes both ways. In yes. The I so mean, you realize when you're on the other side, all the things we thought when we were dancers, I, I see it now. And I remember myself, why don't they do this? This would be easy. I don't understand this. Why don't they change that? Then when you're on the other side and you see the reasons, you say, oh, okay. There's so many aspects to consider financial aspects, people management, seniority, getting the best person for the job. You know, also you are, I felt for a long time in Dresden towards the, like it was the first five years we're building. Then we started touring. Then there was really this golden time of like five years where we were, it was going so well. And then I kind of had, I, I felt under the water. I felt overwhelmed and I kind I realized that I probably did have a bit of a type of a breakdown, but I just didn't feel that I could stop and I didn't even know how to recognize it. So I did my little things. I detached a bit, came back, tried to take space and managed to get myself to a better place. But I had physical and mental issues during that time because there's just so much responsibility placed on you and it never gives up it never lets up you might have a few periods where you feel a little bit okay that's done there's always something coming so i think what's important to work out for me was my my life work balance making sure that my home i bought an apartment in prague years ago it's all set up and gorgeous and i come every weekend to prague which is an hour and a half from dresden i have now a husband i'm married i have my i feel like that aspect if i didn't have this i'm i don't think i could do what i'm doing yeah so you have your own cocoon to yes. um, from which yes. you can operate and you can you know rejuvenate and yeah because and that part is very you know you're giving all the time it's there's so much going out and if there's not enough coming in eventually and i think now i'll be much more aware with my physical being not to uh hurt myself in those ways anymore <clears throat> Oh, that's beautiful. Thank you for sharing that. It's also nice to see it from that perspective and, and be open to share that. Thank you. Um, uh, now I'm lost a little bit. Yeah, I mean, let's go back to what do you think would was your biggest challenge as a dancer, actually? I think, again, here, if we had had in place someone, we don't call it a mental health coach because, you know, there's the physical and mental well-being that is are so important because our dancers are... But I would add emotional because, you yeah. know, this is the byproduct. When I, when I talk, that's why that word of um, mental isn't really the right word. I In there, I incorporate the, phys the, the physical being and the the person inside the emotional being or the you know that your your soul your mind your that aspect um that's why you know we've traditionally been seen as artists but not often recognized as elite athletes that's what we are and well, so there's beings yeah well there's three there's three right so that's exactly right you say there's an artistic element which leads into the person too, I think, technical ability. There's um, 
your physical support that you need, your mental support. I'm just saying that besides all that we do in the studio, there's such a big part that most elite athletes are supported in and we are not. So if you look at a football player or a gymnast, the amount of investment and, and support that they receive to be able to um, deliver their art form or their sport at the highest level is massive. And for some reason, dancers aren't seen that way. So for me, this aspect, if I had had a men, what for lack of better words, performance development, mental health, emotional coach, you know, I think I could have gotten to a very different place with my dancing. I think lots of my stuff was in my mind and confidence and being a perfectionist and not feeling like I could arrive to that where I thought it needed to be. So honestly, in ballet, I never enjoyed myself on stage. If I, if it went well and I came off stage, I would be relieved and think it would, but I wasn't a type of dancer that was just dying to get on the stage because I felt like I was gonna, it was, I was gonna have a good time in a way until I danced Forsyth or maybe some Balanchine, different different things. Also in the contemporary repertoire, like Nacho or um, Yuri Killian at that time, I just felt so much freer because I think my mind was different. So I guess my point to your question of my dancing and what I could have maybe, you know, what what could have been better or helped me or what my issues were, I think that that aspect is hugely important, the kind of mental support that dancers need as human beings but we need that in schools <laughs> yes we need all, all that's a separate um no but that, that's my point for me because i mean having seen a lot of this as well it's again it comes down not necessarily in putting you know a, a dietitian or a psychologist available whatever the teachers need to do they also their own work and once you do your own work then you can you can you can be the person that they can refer to as well, right? And it it's a Absolutely. bit, but it's still very for me. There is still a um, you know the the pit is still really tight because it's something you of course you can't impose that on people because they have to do it from their own will. Of course, that's that's right. But this is an aspect that's really important, you know. But I think, Sabine, what you can do as a director is that you can make that part of the job description, continued learning, and that you provide your staff. That's what we're doing also right now. We're doing a lot of work to try and connect the teams because it was not, not I'm not talking about, let's, so let's take ENB out, yeah, this yeah. idea, and, or Dresden out, that there would be a lot of work needed to connect all of your teams to make sure that they're working together as a collective in the best way for the outcome, right? And that comes down to also um, mentoring and coaching workshops yeah, yeah. and also making sure that one thing that they sign up for is the fact that they are, there are expectations of them attending these workshops and working on themselves. So I guess what I'm saying is I wouldn't accept that someone from my team would just say, I'm not doing that then they couldn't be part of the team. I mean, you, that's what you have to look for. It's the school's the base. So they're planting the seeds. So these kids come out with years of programming, yeah. of physical programming and mental programming. And then you have to almost deprogram and support and help and heal. And it, it, you know, especially I find with young, young women, I mean, the, the kind of, pressure that a woman is under historic traditionally is different than a man. Um, and I find a lot of time for me, I pers I purposely between the time they join at like 18 till their mid twenties, I give the women a lot of space as far as any input saying you need to do this, especially if it's to do with physical things, because I feel like their bodies are still changing people are becoming different people and that just compounding their already their um, insecurities makes it worse. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times through, they are 
dancers are aware of what they need to work on. It's not like they're just pretending it's not there, but for whatever reason, they might need, they need support to actually achieve those things. So I think this is this, the really interesting part right now is saying, what are the pillars of, of, of success? You know, and also um, we with your are, relationship with yourself. <laughs> yeah, it, well, knowing yourself, but but what happens if you do know yourself, but you're just a person that doesn't agree with that? There's also that because wait, wait, we, wait. repeat that. So you no, know, people can know themselves. Um, it's just that people can inherently have different perspectives. So we right. were at the director's retreat in Amsterdam um, at the end of. Uh, February, amazing positioning um, dance that Ted has organized with the Dutch National. And uh, you really saw, interestingly, in the group of 25, the different generations and the different mindsets. And for some people, it felt very overwhelming, all this information to the point where they're going, if I have to do all this stuff, then I'm not doing it. And then other people who were really on it with so many things that you think, oh my God, I, I'm not doing enough, you know? So I think there's a lot more to this puzzle than we thought originally. And I think the main thing to remember is we're leaders. We need to set examples. So it's not us and them and they did that. So I'm doing this. We have to be the stellar examples of what we want, like practice what you preach. So if you want the dancers to act a certain way, they have to be treated like responsible adults. Mm -hmm. and they have to be expected to act like responsible adults, not children. They're not boys and girls anymore. They're men and women. And I think, I think in that way, uh, we can try and shift this. Yeah, and it comes down to, I mean, because I, I completely understand what you're saying is that, you know, it's something to give a voice to someone and, and ask them to do this inner work. But it doesn't mean that everything is going to go their way. They do sign a contract. They agree to certain values to be respected, to certain rules to be also yeah. respected in order to yeah. function, right? So yeah. it's all a, I mean, it's also being responsible for for what you want in life, you know? And yeah. it, and and we are not taught that, you know? You're like, in a, I have to dance, I have to dance, I have to dance, you know? And yeah. yeah. <laughs> Just Absolutely. That. But I think the teachers are also taught that too, that maybe traditionally they think this is the way you do it. You just yeah. well, because you don't know any other way. And if you're not curious, then you don't learn any other way. <laughs> but there's the ticket, curiosity. Yeah. And this this kind of idea that you're constantly learning, I find so exciting. Yeah. I don't find that as like, oh God, I I'm 60 and I'm or I'm 50 and I know it all. I don't need to learn anymore. You know, that that mentality for me is difficult to understand. And I I feel very differently to that. Yeah. Well, there's hope. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, it all sounds good. Then the other side is big expectations, right? So for me right now, coming having the opportunity to come into a new environment. And I have a year to feel my way around and get to know people. I haven't actually started officially directing. So everything's nice. There's lots of ideas. Things are being put in place. There's a lot of hope and expectations. And now it will be really up to me to follow through on what I'm saying and really put the work in to make that kind of environment that I talk to, you know? Yeah, but it's also accepting that you will have, you know, hurdles on the road. And it's not like, I mean, Absolutely. I mean, it's not going to be a straight line and it's going to be difficult because if you do what you want to do, wow, it's exciting. <laughs> it's exciting. And I mean, also, maybe this is a difference from the era I was when I started. And now I used to feel that I had to have everything done so quickly. So now, you know, I've signed a five-year contract and I'm looking at it over long, like a, a, a long-term vision so that these things were slowly working at methodically. It's not like just get it in place. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what feels really um, positive and possible is yeah. that there's time. These baby steps are happening and we will get there as a collective. So yeah, I'm really excited. 
Nice. Well, I'm I'm very excited to to hear all this. <laughs> so, I mean, I had many other questions, but I think we're gonna we're gonna you know not go too far, okay. and I don't want to take too much of your time. So, to finish this, I would like you to you know, if you have one advice to give a young dancer, you know, starting his or her career right now, what would that be? Hmm, interesting because what I notice is the generations are so distinct now, even before you felt it sort of every decade and now you feel it almost every few years. And, um, Hmm. I would say, you know, just keep your design and your ideas for where you want to be at the forefront. You know, even if you don't know exactly how you're going to get there, keep that, vision firmly in place and just work towards it with the idea that in my mind, it's sort of like, there's no option. I'm going to get there. And then when you have the opportunities to present yourself, remember that you know, directors are seeing so many dancers. So you really have to show something that makes you unique. It, for me, at least maybe it's different. I'm not just looking at the technical aspect. I'm looking at artistry and I'm looking at a person. So I, after, usually I, I can't tell usually in a class, I like to work with people afterwards. I like to talk to people and really try to show the person that you are. I know people are starting out young and maybe still figuring I it out. I don't know who you are. That's a problem, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. I mean, or even if you don't know exactly who you are, try to be not just fit in and be kind of another X, like we're all equal, all harmonic, that, that you have something in, it can just be the way your attention, the way you, your detail, something that makes you different, that you, that makes you stand out so that you have that moment where the director is going, oh, that's interesting. You know, I, it's, it's very hard for young dancers today. I, I do say it's not like when we were young, there were so many companies it seemed to go to that were right in their heyday with new choreographers. You know, I remember seeing Yuri Killian or Forsyth or Matt Sack and just thinking, or Balanchine or all the stars that we had back then, the dancers. Um, of course, we have very talented dancers, but I think it's a very different place and it's difficult. There's not as many opportunities. Well, and also with those young companies, it's very difficult too, because it's like a... a, a you know, it's not necessarily when you get into the young company, you get in the main one. And for, yeah. for a lot of dancers that I've seen, that is their career, the young company, yeah. and that's it. So Absolutely. it's very difficult. Yeah, the, the world it's is hard. narrow. It's hard to say one thing to say. I would just say, try, because I feel like the young generation, and it's great, they've had a lot more space to figure themselves out. They've got a lot of much more um, evolved platform to voice their opinions and things. But um, I think that, you know, in the end of the day, they're going to be the ones that make this happen. You can't wait for other people to tell you, or even have sometimes like the teacher will call me or the school will call me to tell me something about the student. I'm very open. I'm like, at this point, they're adults to me we can talk, they should talk, they should say their, their feelings and have a dialogue. And actually, I don't have children, but I feel like, you know, all, all of my dancers in the company are like my family. And it's part of me to help develop and educate them so that they become these, these interesting and productive, um, successful human beings. Wow. Okay. <laughs> Sorry for the bells. I'm living oh, right behind the church. No worries. Uh, I actually didn't hear them. But uh, so are you accessible, actually, Aaron? Because a lot of directors now are completely not accessible. Yeah, I'm very accessible. And I mean, sometimes maybe too much. But um, I, all the dancers have my email address. Um, people, they have no issues contacting me all the time. So I'm constantly in touch with them. And I like to take that extra person away. I feel that that is actually a problem when you distance yourself, it fractures your communication. So for me, I like to hear directly from them. 
And as I said, with this new mental or, or development coach, performance coach aspect, lots of that can come through them and give them tools to work on themselves and help themselves so that when they do come to me, they're very articulate. Mm -hmm. It's not asking me what I think they should do. It's coming with a plan. But and not then, a plan, but maybe they can even solve their problems themselves. <laughs> that's that's And that's what's happening. Like, interestingly, 60% of the time that's happening. Oh, so yes. that just makes my daily... Um, my job, what I'm filling my days with that maybe in Dresden until now would have been 60% that dealing with my dancers and my staff um, is down to about 30% gives me a lot more space to do the other things that I'm responsible for and then still have daily contact with them. Great. Okay. Yeah. Wow. Aaron, thank you so much. Uh, uh, thank you, Sabine. Thank you very much for this uh, a possibility. Also, great. it's been interesting chatting. So, I wish you uh, all the very, very best for London, you know, for this new uh, experience and new adventure. And I really hope you can put um, everything we talked about into action because I'm looking forward to hearing from it. Thank you. Thank you very much. And all the best to you as well. Thank you, Aaron. Okay, take care.